Well, hello and welcome. If you are going to be with us through the end of this message, I want to start by reminding you that this is the first Sunday of the month, and so we are going to be taking communion together at the end of this sermon. And I would like you to go and get whatever it is that you have for taking communion. If you have bread and juice or or anything really that can substitute, is, this would be a great time to go and get that so that you're prepared at the end when we take it together. Well, in 1989, you might have found me standing in my high school bathroom in Kansas, putting on maybe blue or purple mascara in the bathroom mirror. That was the style then. And I can guarantee that if I was doing that, that right at the same time, the mean girls would come in. The mean girls, they were mean with just words. Um, I was lucky that they weren't mean with fists or anything like that, but they were, they were mean with their words and sometimes whispers and sometimes giggles, and they were the mean girls. And I knew each one of their names. Amy, Tiffany, Corey, Kelsey, and Jennifer. There were a lot of them, and they were mean. I wasn't sure that they knew my name, though. I think they just thought of me as being one of the people in the room that was easily picked on. But I know that they knew how to be mean. And fast forward some years to 2019 when I got a Facebook message from one of the mean girls. It turns out that she must have remembered my name at some point to find me on Facebook, and she sent me a message saying, I'm sorry, I was mean. Will you forgive me? Well, my temptation, of course, was to say, no, I'm not going to forgive you. I would have loved to, in my, in my personal desire for revenge, to have held her captive to the shame that I decided that she deserved, the shame that she had dealt me. But as a follower of Jesus, I just couldn't do that. It was definitely, however, a temptation. Because shame has become the standard human condition. Grace is completely foreign to us. Whether you were the mean girl in the bathroom or you were the girl tempted to be mean 30 years later, you understand that there are communities who are shaped by shame. Whether the use of shame gave you power or if it took away your power, you and I have experienced these communities that are based on shame. And these kinds of communities have existed since humans left the garden and they began living in human society. Today we're going to look at a community based on shame from the book of John in chapter 9. And starting in verse 1, it says this, in John chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Well, shame, you see, is assumed from the very beginning of this conversation. Jesus is walking along with his disciples, and they see a person that is blind. And Jesus' followers just assume that there is someone to blame for this situation. Someone has to be responsible for this, because they aren't really clear on who Jesus is yet. They're still walking those paths and figuring it out, like some of us are. They are surprised by his answer. In verse 3, 
Jesus says this, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Well, for this man, his blindness represented the source of shame, both for him and for his family in that community. Everyone assumed that either he or his parents had done something wrong to deserve him being blind from birth. And it's probable that this man, even him himself, began to believe that this was true, that he deserved this shame somehow. Communities based on shame have this ability, this ability to reinforce shame, to re and reinforce it so that even the people who are victimized by it become complacent and they believe that they are shameful. Just to be clear, Jesus says at the very beginning of this passage that there is no sin involved here. At the beginning of the encounter, Jesus says, there's no sin on the part of this man or his family that is involved in his condition because there's no shame in having a disability. This man is made in God's image and there's no shame in it, but he's been made to feel that there is. And he feels like there is because his community's response to him and his family is a response of a community that is based on shame. But Jesus responds to his shame with grace. He heals him. He heals him. The shame is, the shame is gone. It's immediately released from him. There, there's no reason for the shame. And if his followers had been clear that Jesus was the God-man, that Jesus was God in the flesh, then they would not have been perhaps so surprised because they might have known that Jesus would act consistently with who he is. And since God is gracious God will always act consistently with that part of his character and Jesus as God. So he heals the man to demonstrate his grace. And to this man, Jesus is the face of grace. And that should be the end of a very happy story. But the story continues and is because communities that are based on shame hate grace. Grace disrupts a system that thrives on shame. It, it just blows it all out of the water. And when people gain power through a system, they work really hard to perpetuate it. And this town, with its community of shame is no exception. In John chapter 9, starting in verse 8, it says this. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. And he replied, the man that they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and I washed. And then I could see. Where is this man? They asked him. I don't know, he said. Let's 
let's just take a break for a second and let's notice that no one seems to be very happy for this man. Why are they not happy? Like, where are the streamers, the, the balloons? Where's the parade? They should be very happy for this man because he can now see and he wasn't able to before. That should bring a party. But this community doesn't know how to party, apparently. He is healed, but no one seems to be happy for him. And that's because shame has to blame someone. It has to blame someone. And in this community based on shame, a man who has been shamed for years because of his disability, but now suddenly is healed, leaves no one to blame. It leaves nobody for them to blame. But don't worry, they will still find people to blame. Because shame-based communities always turn against those that they deem guilty. And sometimes they also circle the wagons to protect those within that are guilty. Because both of these are the norm for shame-based communities. We continue in verse 13. It says, They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Well, the Sabbath was a, is a day of rest for the Jewish people. It still is. Um, observant Jews in this day and age, um, and still today, would do no work on the Sabbath, between Friday sundown and Saturday sundown. Um, this is commanded by God in the Ten Commandments. And in Exodus 20, starting in verse 8, it says, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Well, the Sabbath is meant to provide rest um, for the people and, and remind the people that they are dependent on God, that they are not self-sufficient, that they are dependent. And they can't depend only on their own work. So they weren't allowed to require anyone to work one day a week. So everyone got a day off on that day of the week, and it seemed like a wise plan. Take a day off. That sounds like a plan. Um, but something that God intended for good eventually became a tool for shame because lots more rules got added on top of this command. Over the years, they added all these rules that tried to keep people in line with the original command to force compliance by adding rules and using shame to control people. In case you, and you didn't know, like work, it takes a lot of work to, for say, plow a field. If you have ever plowed a field with heavy machinery, then you know that it is a lot of work, even with the machines. But in this day and age, it would be a lot of work for a man and an animal and a, a plow. This makes sense not to do on a day that is not for working, right? Plowing the ground, loosening up all that dirt, it's a lot of work. But then on top of this, there were more rules that were added. Because watering the ground can have the same effect as plowing. If you 
put enough water out there, the soil will loosen. And so watering the ground began, began to be something that was not allowed to happen on the Sabbath. And eventually, because this is how rules go, they become more and more on top of one another so that you lose the sense of why something was done in the first place. And eventually, because watering the ground was outlawed, spitting on the ground was also outlawed. And it just began to be a little bit ridiculous over time. Spitting on the ground isn't a lot of work, doesn't keep you from taking a day off. Um, sometimes you might spit on the ground because you have the day off, I don't know. But if you have ever read the details of, let's say, a, a student handbook or a homeowner's association manual, or if you have read the employee handbook at your job, then you understand how this happens. The, the law is there in order to keep people safe. And then on top of that, we have to add rules in order to fill the cracks that people sometimes find around those rules. And then we add more rules and more rules, and the accretion of rules just gets more and more and more to the point where now you have a thick binder of rules instead of a simple handbook. No one might even know what all those rules are, except the people who have put themselves in charge of enforcing those rules. And I, I understand how this works. Um, I used to work as a school teacher. And when I was a school teacher, I worked in a school with a dress code. And it was my least favorite thing to do to pay attention to the dress code. I hated enforcing the dress code. It, it started as a good thing. Let, let's have a standard of dress around here. That seems like a good thing to have, but it began to be so much work. I had one student whose skirt length just couldn't keep up with her growth, and she was in maybe in fifth or sixth grade. Um, she would be like any student who was out of dress code. They would be sent downstairs to go to the closet where there were all of these old mismatched, um, unusually sized uh, garments that fit the dress code. And it would be the responsibility of the teacher who had found the student out of dress code to help the student find clothing from the closet that fit the student and the dress code. And it became very, very difficult. Um, we would work through piles and piles of clothes and not find anything that this student could wear. And eventually, I just became so frustrated with it, I stopped looking to see if her skirt was long enough. Enforcing the dress code became just as much work as trying to live by it. And that's how rule enforcement goes. It's exhausting for everyone involved. It doesn't mean, though, that all the rules are bad. Here's the thing. The original command of God here is the standard that he set. Take a day off. The rule was made by God for the good of the people. If you were a Jew in that time, you were subject to the law the people who were under your authority every day would be glad if you would follow that law. Because if you worked every day and you required your workers to work every day, then everyone would be worn out and you would be guilty of breaking the command of God. And we call that true guilt you would have been truly guilty of breaking God's command. But let's say you took the day off, 
and you're enjoying time with your friends and your family. You're sitting out on the porch and playing with the kids, and you're just horsing around. And you decide, oh, let's turn on the sprinkler. Let the kids run through it. It's hot out here. Well, then, is your neighbor going to be able to come over and tell you that you are in the wrong for watering the ground on your day off? Maybe. Because anyone who tried to shame you for watering your lawn would have been holding you to human standards that were added on top of God's standards. And when people try to make us feel guilty for breaking the laws that they have put in place and tell us that we are breaking God's laws, then they are the ones who are wrong not us. We call that false guilt. False guilt is if you have been shamed into feeling guilty for breaking a human rule that someone tried to tell you was God's rule. You're not guilty before God. They were creating false guilt. And this isn't to say that communities or families or groups of people can't decide together to make rules that they're all going to agree to. That's part of human society, of of coming together and finding out how can we work best together. Rules that a family or a neighborhood agree on together, they make a stronger bond between people who belong in that group. Um, Those kinds of rules can, can make us feel like we are more connected and that we're we're able to trust the people that we live around. It can make life better for people who live in that family or in that community. But when, when people make laws for other people and say that those are God's laws, they are creating false guilt. And communities based on shame use false guilt to control. And that's what is happening to this man who used to be blind. The community is subjecting him to false guilt and shame. Let's see if it works. We're in verse 15. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God. For he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. And the man replied, he is a prophet. The grace that has been shown to this man who has been healed is is causing this ripple effect. He has been called to give an account of his own healing as if he is to blame for it. And still, there's still nobody that's happy for him. Now, this is causing a problem in the community, and this has to be dealt with. If he isn't to blame for this, then the community will find someone to blame. They've started almost putting the blame on Jesus, but they're not going to stop there. In verse 18, it says this, they still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that he, now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had already decided that anyone that acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That is why his parents said, he is of age. Ask him. Well, someone has to be blamed for this disruption of the community. And if it's not the man who has been healed himself, then maybe it's his parents. 
and they take a pass. They're, no, he is an adult. He is responsible for himself. You can ask him because they don't want to risk rejection themselves. They push the rejection back on their child. They want to remain part of this community, even though it's a community that's based on shame. And so they have to push this blame on someone, even if that someone else is their very own son. They turn their face away from him. Because communities that are based on shame perpetuate shaming. A second time, they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Well, if you're listening today and you aren't sure if you're a Christian or if you're sure that you're not, you might be thinking that the church has been a big perpetuator of this type of controlling, shame-based community. And you are right. There are more examples in the news every time we turn around. A shame-based community turns against those that they deem guilty, and to their own shame, they circle the wagons and protect the guilty within. In this, the, the larger church, and especially in the U.S., has often been a shame-based community. We have taken our cues from the world's natural way of doing things rather than following the example that Jesus sets for us. And we have done this, and we're wrong when we do it. And this man here is finding out the hard way that he is living in a community based on shame. But what can he say? All he knows is that he has been healed. And so over and over and over again, he just repeats the same thing. I was blind, and now I see. And this is what we know about grace received. First, grace received can't be explained. It can only be testified to. As as we've seen over the last few weeks, Grace is undeserved movement towards relationship. And when we're living in the shame cycle, that evil merry-go-round that just keeps on, keeps on spinning, we can't seem to escape this cycle of guilt, fear, hiding, separation, and blame. Grace finds us there. And it frees us from the power of shame. Grace isn't just an impersonal force, though. It's not just an idea or an ideal. It's not just a general principle. See, grace always has a face that goes with it. And Jesus is that face of grace to the man whose community is about to turn away from him because he won't accept the false guilt, 
that they want to heap on him. All he can say is he has been healed. And secondly, we know from this story and from our personal experience that grace received may cause rejection from a community of shame. The people of this community had the opportunity, I mean, actually, they had lots of opportunities where they could have shown this man grace like Jesus did. Jesus showed him grace by showing up in his town and by healing him. And and his town, however, turned their backs on him. They've heard his story. But because his story threatens their community's way of doing things, they have circled the wagons and kicked out the person that they see as the threat. They also have the chance to demonstrate grace by just having a party. Be glad for this man whose life has been changed by his encounter with Jesus. They had a chance to show that grace has a face, but instead they doubled down on shaming this man to the point of forcing his rejection from his family, from his place of worship, from his community. When grace frees us from the power of shame and gets us out of the cycle of shame, Sometimes it also has to liberate us from a community of shame. And grace is there to carry this man through that rejection. Because grace has a face, grace received connects us to a new community, a community of grace. Grace is movement towards relationship, even when it isn't deserved. But it can also be movement towards relationship when others have been rejected in places that only know how to operate out of shame. Grace is enough for both the true guilt that each one of us has and also for the false guilt that others have tried to place on us. And grace finds us in our shame. That's how Jesus shows up again to show grace to this man. In verse 35 of John chapter 9, it says, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one who is speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what, are we blind too? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Well, Jesus moves towards the man who has been rejected from his community. But he has nothing but judgment for those who pretend that their way of enforcing the cycle of shame on this man is right. Grace Church, let's not be a community based on shame. Let's be a community of grace. Let's live up to our name and our calling to be a community of grace to those who are here and those who are coming. How do we do this? First, we acknowledge our own shame. We have no reason to hide from God or from others. God already knows. Grace frees us from the cycle of shame, but only when we come out of hiding. In 1 John 
chapter 1, verses 5 through 10, John writes this. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. So we begin by acknowledging our own shame. And second, we live in grace as we have been shown grace. When we receive grace from Jesus, it's not just ours to keep to ourselves. This is a great gift, but it is such a great gift that it overflows. It's never used up by our shame is enough grace that we can share it with the people around us. Our grace that we have received from Jesus also connects us to a community of others who have experienced that grace. Here together in that community, we remember that it is not something that we could do ourselves is not our own goodness that saves us. This community of grace isn't built on being right, on being better than the people outside. It's not built on shame. It's built on our common need for the grace of Jesus. And we share that common need with everyone in the world is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that frees us from the power of shame to show that grace to others. And as we close, we're going to remember. We're going to remember that gift of grace together. Wherever you are, whenever you are watching this, you are part of that community of grace, and we are going to partake in communion together. Communion is a symbolic act that Christians around the world and for centuries have participated in to help themselves remember. And we want to remember two important things. The first thing is that Jesus died on the cross was buried, he lay there for three days to take away the penalty for our sin. And even though he was dead, he rose to life again, securing for us eternal life because we are united to him. By grace, through faith in his work, we are made right with God and our shame is taken away. And secondly, that union with him, it places us into a relationship with one another in a community that is built on grace. It's a grace that we commonly together have received. We take communion, not on our own, but as a community, not individually, but corporately as one, you and me and everyone else who is participating today is participating in communion together as a community. Now, if you're listening to this today and you have decided that you need the grace that Jesus offers, you can receive it now by faith. And then if you have done so, I would love to have you participate with us in communion. 
because communion is designed for those who have experienced the life-changing grace of Jesus Christ and have received his grace by faith. As we are taking the cup and the bread now, let's remember how Jesus told his disciples to do so. Let's take first the bread. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body that is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Go ahead. And next, let's take the cup. After dinner, the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new, co the new covenant, my blood that is spilled for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's do that together now. Now together, let's pray to our God, the God of grace, the gracious God who has done so much for each one of us, who has brought us out of our shame and put us into a relationship of grace with himself and with one another. Father, we thank you. We thank you for all that you have done for us, that our shame is taken away that you, through Jesus' death and resurrection, have removed our shame and have brought us into eternal new life of grace with you. Thank you for putting us in a community of grace. Father, help us to show that grace to those around us this week. We thank you and re we remember together. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you guys next week.